one of the most polarizing figures in Christian churches since 2016 has to be our former president, Donald J. Trump. And with his recent statements regarding some of the most important political topics for Christians, some are wondering if he has gone off the political deep end. And NFL player DeMar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills collapses on the field as many people are asking what happened. And the NFL has actually started a, quote, pray for DeMar campaign with all 32 NFL teams. Stay with us as we look at these and other stories on the 511 News. Welcome back to the 511 News. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And on today's episode, we're going to be looking at none other than Donald J. Trump. And we're going to be talking about some of the polarizing ideas that he has laid out recently on his new campaign trail to to try to be the president once again, as well as DeMar Hamlin, the NFL player, the safety for the Buffalo Bills, who collapsed on the field during a Monday night football game, causing the game to, as far as we know, looks to be canceled in the middle of a playoff race. But one of the things we want to ask you to do is make sure you click like on this video. Could you also subscribe to Good Fight Ministries? And if you would like to, if you're one of those people that listens on podcasts, make sure to leave a five five star review if you feel so led. That helps us get to the top And so that when we discuss these news and events, the things that are taking place, we bring them back into the captivity of Christ and hopefully get a better understanding of what the Word of God says in light of what's going on around us. So with all of that, I wanted to look at some of the things that Donald Trump has recently said and some comments that he's made along the way since running for and even winning the presidency. And one of the things I want to start out with is the reality that it seems to be that Donald Trump has really created a chasm with brothers and sisters in Christ who, whether or not they're big Trump fans or never Trumpers or otherwise, that people have broke fellowship, even families have been separated, people have even left churches for one reason or another. And I can say personally, from our own fellowship here at Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, because we were too pro-Trump, some would say, then guess what? Just by saying, hey, there's some good things that have happened. Look at Roe v. Wade has absolutely, there's no doubt about it, Roe v. Wade was only overturned because Trump got pro-life, that doesn't mean they're Christian, but pro-life Supreme Court justices that voted Roe v. Wade out and did just push it back to the states. And that doesn't happen if Hillary Clinton would have won. So there were certain things, economic reasons and so forth, that you could point out and say, these are good things. But what that didn't do is whitewash so much of the wicked things that Trump was about and was clearly about. And so we, without a doubt, had people from our church that left to other fellowships because both took place. One, you're not pro-Trump enough for me. And others, I won't go there anymore because they don't recognize that Trump is the Antichrist. Because when you take a biblical stance and you take each and every individual and you take each and every decision that is made and take it in light of Scripture rather than my opinion or my political push, that somewhat polarizes you with these polarizing figures. In fact, I can't tell you how many comments that people wrote. If you don't understand how Trump is being used by God, then I can't trust your ministry and your discernment. Literally those comments on our YouTube channels, because we simply say we need to address the very wicked things that he has pushed. And also there are some praiseworthy things we can say, well, praise God, this took place. There were also a number of false teachers in what is known as the New Apostolic Reformation, teachers pushing pushing the Seven Mountain Mandate, that tried to paint, did entire sermon series on Trump as, guess what? Trump is Samson. Trump is Cyrus. And they would go and try to find these parallels. Look at Samson was really popular about his hairdo. Oh, look at Trump is really popular with his hairdo. Samson had a problem with a lot of different women. Trump has a problem with a lot of different women. 
all of these like nonsensical, I cannot believe that you are drawing these conclusions and this nonsense. And it's an embarrassment to the body of Christ that those things were preached and taught from pulpits on Sunday mornings, on the Lord's day, while they were gathering together these sort of nonsensical, unexegetical, ridiculous teachings. And in all honesty, it's an embarrassment. So I say all that to say, when we look at, I think anyone, we need to judge with righteous judgment, as Jesus said in John 7, 24, that we need to look at what's going on and say, where can we point out those things which are praiseworthy and also those things which are clearly wicked. And in his most recent statement, and this isn't something new, so I want to chron- go a little bit chronological, but we'll be jumping around a bit, but this isn't something new. And a lot of people are trying to figure out what took place in the most recent voting when everyone was predicting this red wave, not just Christians, not just conservatives, not just political pundits, but even those on the left, even liberals were saying, this is going to be a red wave. Oh no, look at everything that's happened with the lockdowns. Look at everything that's happened with our economy because of Joe Biden. So now everyone's going to vote Republican. And then it was barely even a trickle. So a lot of people are saying, what is the reason? What happened in the voting? So Donald Trump is going to tell you what happened on Truth Social. This is what he stated. It wasn't my fault that the Republicans didn't live up to expectations in the midterms. I was 233 and 20. It was the, quote, abortion issue, poorly handled by many Republicans, especially those that firmly insisted on no exceptions, even in the case of rape, incest, or life of the mother, that lost large numbers of voters. Also, the people that pushed so hard for decades against abortion got their wish from the U.S. Supreme Court and just plain disappeared, not to be seen again. The thing I want to focus on there is, one, he, if this is his view on abortion, absolutely cuts the legs out of the argument. Because once you do not realize that when we are talking about a baby inside of the womb, and once you make that baby less worthy because of the situation in which that baby was made uh, viable in the mother's womb, as soon as you do that, you have cut the legs out of the argument. You have cut the legs out of stating this is a person, so killing this person is murder. As soon as you do that and accept, by the way, this slippery slope that has taken place with LGBTQ rights, with you know, abortion, with all of these different things, when you look at it, a slippery slope, this, oh, let's just give them a little inch and they won't take a mile. This is sick and it is sad. And sadly enough, this is exactly what most Christians warned about in terms of the acceptance of Trump back in 2016 and prior during the primaries. When people warned, hey, it looks like what is now the conservative ticket is being moved into a gray area or into a blue area, actually. And a lot of these things seem more libertarian than they actually seem conservative. Because if you are not conserving the life of the baby in the womb, what are you conserving? And when we look at this, if you are willing If you are willing to acquiesce, because look, we could get more votes if we accept this. How'd that work for Rudy Giuliani when he tried to run for president and he was a pro-choice president? How did that work for him? And the truth is, you accepting these arguments and accepting those who are okay with this shows that you really don't believe that that is a baby inside of that womb. And also, I can tell you from having conversation after conversation, sharing the gospel on the streets, sharing with people all over the world concerning this issue of abortion, when you talk to them, one of the first things they will say is what happens in a rape or an incest or the life of the mother. And you can just simply ask them, well, what if that was the case? What if we said, hey, fine, then no abortions. Are you saying that now abortion should be illegal and it should be considered murder if these three instances are not how the baby became viable in the womb? And of course, what do they say? Well, no, no, because really what this is, is a red heron. Really what this is, is a lie. And ultimately, when you have the, you know, Donald Trump, former president here, saying we need to accept these provisions, what you're saying is those babies' lives don't matter. I don't know of any case where someone says, 
because these parents did horrible and heinous things, we should kill the child. It is a travesty. And the thing is, we need to point at the law being done and dealt with swiftly on rapists. And when the law is dealt with swiftly and those rapists are put to their end, that is what we need to focus on. We shouldn't say, look at this rapist, this disgusting, vile, disgusting person. Let's kill his child. We should say, we need to make sure that the ramifications of such a thing are so extreme that they would never think about taking advantage of a woman in that way. That is where we need to stand on this. But this is not the first time. In fact, with a lot of the heartbeat bills were being were being pushed while he was president, which was exciting for a lot of believers, even though as Christians, we need to make sure we go all the way back to conception. The truth is, when it comes to this very issue, Trump was against these heartbeat bills. And in fact, this is what he had said while president, quote, I am strongly pro-life with three exceptions, rape, incest, and protecting the life of the mother. And in fact, if you want to see cowardice, Watch Donald Trump when he is asked the question whether or not killing a baby, something that you have to premeditate to do, killing a baby inside of a womb, when he's asked whether or not it's actually murder. Do you think it's murder, abortion? Um, I have my opinions on it, but I'd rather not comment on it. You said you're very pro-life. Pro-life view is that it's abortion. Abortion is murder. But I, I, uh, I mean, I do have my opinions on it. I'd rather... I just don't think it's inappropriate for him. But you don't disagree with that proposition that it's murder? What, what proposition? That abortion is murder. No, I don't disagree with it. Notice how nervous he gets and that I I, I don't want to I don't want to answer that. You know, he, he has a lot of things he's really, you know, able to be boisterous about and loud. But when it comes to this, he has a really tough time. But I think it's because he has changed his views, honestly, in the hopes of getting elected. And it probably did work. And in fact, the people that he appointed ended up, guys, there are a ton of Planned Parenthoods that are out of business in this country and less abortions have taken place simply because Roe v. Wade was overturned. We cannot get around that and praise God for that. But his actual views and where he stands, here is what he had to say on Meet the Press long before he had ever run for president. Big issue in Washington. Would President Trump ban partial birth abortion? Well, look, I'm... I'm very pro-choice. I hate the concept of abortion. I hate it. I hate everything it stands for. I cringe when I listen to people debating the subject. But you still, I just believe in choice. And again, it may be a little bit of a New York background because there is some different attitude in different parts of the country. And, you know, I was raised in New York and grew up and work and everything else in New York City. But I am strongly for choice. And yet I hate the concept of abortion. But you would not ban it. No. Or ban partial birth abortion. No, I would, I would, I am, I am pro-choice in every respect and as far as it goes, but I just hate it. Notice that that is actually affirming partial birth abortion at one point. I mean, that's pretty sick. That's pretty sad. And it's great when we can forgive people and say, wow, that was, those were horrible positions and hopefully you've changed. But ultimately he doesn't have the right epistemology. He doesn't have the right foundation for his answer to understand that it is Jesus himself. It is God's word is very clear that it is God who forms the baby inside of the womb. In fact, when it comes to this abortion issue, the first person to even recognize Jesus as the Messiah was John the Baptist in the womb of his mother. And guess what? He was cognitive enough to jump because the Holy Spirit was in there. And it's not that clump of cells that was able to recognize Jesus as Messiah. No, that's not how it works. It's not a clump of cells. It was John the Baptist in that womb, just as it was God with us, Emmanuel, in the womb of Mary. But this slippery slope, this dangerous trail that that has happened in conservative party, so much of it we heard right before Trump was trying to be elected in 2016 when the clip was played of him talking about grabbing a married woman by something I don't want to repeat. And I watched with my own eyes Christians online saying, well, it's just locker room talk. Well, Jesus says that every idle word will be judged. Every idle word that you speak and out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
And it's one thing to say, I shouldn't have said that. I'm so sorry. I can't believe that I would utter such things and I need to repent of it. It's another thing for someone to just call it locker room talk. And it's another, another thing for Christians to say, it's just locker room talk and fall right in line with that sort of behavior. And on the abortion issue, plenty of Christians have changed their views. Professing Christians, professing conservatives who claim to be Christians, all of these different things have changed their views on these things to acquiesce to their favorite president, to their favorite candidate, or even just suppressed what they truly believe in order to hopefully get this guy elected. And it's it's a sad, sad thing. But the abortion issue is not the only issue. And, and guys, these are ironclad issues for the Christians when we talk about these things. Killing of the babies in the womb, and also when it comes to marriage, and what we believe the Bible is clear on when it comes to marriage. Any marriage outside of the marriage between one man and one woman, that marriage is not a marriage. It is a show. It is a freak show, and it's not something that the Bible describes. So when somebody says, this man is married to this man, or this woman is married to this woman, we can say that's not a marriage. You can call it whatever you want. Ultimately, it's just a perversion, but it's not a marriage. Marriage is between a man and a woman. But what's interesting about Trump is that he was actually the first president elected bring pro, being pro-homosexual marriage. And you say, what about Barack Obama? Absolutely not, actually. Barack Obama, just a couple of months prior to being elected, was in Rick Warren's church. <laughs> but uh, he actually said that he believed that marriage is between one man and one woman when he got elected. Of course, that was a lie. Of, of course, uh, he was very pro-gay marriage. But, but in terms of when he was elected, that wasn't his stance. Trump, on the other hand, entirely different stance. Donald Trump is the most pro-gay Republican nominee ever. Elections are always about choices, uh, and the choice in this election is either Hillary Clinton is going to be the next president of the United States or Donald Trump is. And for me, despite my differences with Trump in the past, it was a slam dunk. I want Donald Trump to be president. For me, terrorism and our safety in this world is an LGBT issue. For me, health, you know, healthcare is an LGBT issue. For me, retirement security is an LGBT issue. For me, jobs is an LGBT issue. Because all of those issues impact the LGBT community. I have no doubt that Donald Trump presidency would be better for LGBT Americans. But what about Donald Trump reassuring people like Jerry Falwell Jr. and other evangelical Christians and pastors that he will be on their side on issues like marriage? Donald Trump can say that he disagrees on the, the issue of marriage, but it's a, it's a settled issue. We're not going to have a constitutional amendment. We're not going to have the Supreme Court that's going to reverse it. The left wants you to want gay people to believe that because that's what they want to scare you into going and voting for Hillary Clinton. That's not the case. The fact is, marriage equality is, is, is settled. And you might say he might have changed his views now. How is it different now? Is he, is he now for traditional marriage, which you can find plenty of those things on liberal uh, websites telling you that Trump is actually very against gay rights. And you can find things on conservative websites that say that as well. And, and, and both. But actually, let's talk about something that just recently took place. Scenes from a celebration of the same-sex marriage law at Mar-a-Lago, Thursday night's log cabin Republicans, quote, Spirit of Lincoln Gala, in the main ballroom of Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago beachfront club was a joyous celebration of gay rights. But the main attraction, obviously, was Trump. He received a standing ovation after delivering an enthusiastic affirmation of gay rights not often heard in the GOP. We are fighting for the gay community, and we are fighting and fighting hard, the former president and 2024 candidate said, quote, with the help of many of the people here tonight in recent years, our movement has taken incredible strides. The strides you've made here is incredible. Throughout the evening, speakers praised Trump for his embrace of the gay community. They credited him for his initiatives to combat the criminalization of homosexuality his work pushing for public health initiatives to combat the HIV epidemic and for appointing the first openly gay cabinet member, Grenell, as director of national intelligence. I'm sure if this was something I was reading about Joe Biden, plenty of people would be very upset about it, but hopefully Christians are seeing the hypocrisy and the fact that he will acquiesce ultimately to get whatever votes he can Whatever strategy that may come, I believe he is a chameleon of sorts when it comes to these things. But 
not only do we have Trump with these views, Trump also uh, clearly, when we look at this, has a lot of friends that are false teachers. Uh, Kenneth Copeland posted a letter that Trump wrote to him from the White House on August 16th talking about Kenneth Copeland, the false prosperity teacher, and his half a century that he's devoted to his life and faith and humanity and his enduring commitment for spreading the word of God that has influenced the lives of people across the United States. Donald Trump, of course, doing none other than having, of course, Mr. Copeland open up one of his rallies with a prayer, the very false teacher. Donald Trump's own son recently has started selling Bibles with American flags on them. Donald Trump Jr., not only somebody who left his wife and was with more recently with a political commentator from Fox News, but even in a speech at a Turning Point USA gathering, stated that the turn the other cheek has really gotten us nowhere. I mean, that he's now selling a Bible that says the very words of Jesus, and he says the words of Jesus have gotten us nowhere. These guys, I got to be honest, are charlatans, and they will use whatever they can in order to bring about the change they want to have and the political gain that they can have. And do not allow yourself to be separated from the brethren because of these political gains, political means, and things that obviously are not of God one way or the other. I don't think we should separate fellowship on these things, but we should warn and point these things out. But I want to talk about something, and we'll have some sadness, but also bring to light uh, something that is taking place. And when DeMar Hamlin, the safety for the Buffalo Bills, was struck in the chest and then stood up and fell and collapsed in a recent Monday night football game, a lot of people had a lot of reactions really quick. One thing that happens, and it reminds me of a scripture in Proverbs 27, 14, that says, if you scream blessings in the morning, they'll be taken as curses. That sometimes even the right thing, like a blessing, said at the wrong time, it can be taken as a curse. And I don't even know if a lot of this is the right thing, because a lot of people pointed to this and immediately thought, oh, it might have been because of a shot that he had taken. And immediately that's the commentary. And don't get me wrong, when you see of Sergio Aguero of Barcelona and you see Christian Eriksen, guys that all of a sudden are in great shape and collapse, and some have lost their career and some their life all of a sudden to cardiac arrest, and you go, wait a second, what is going on? That's a reality. But when other things take place like this, and that's the first thing you think to push out, I have to say it's very dangerous, and it can be used against you in the court of public opinion, and it will be used against you in the court of public opinion, because what will happen is that you will look like somebody who's not concerned for a person's life. But I wanted to go into this because I think what it ultimately should do is bring us to a place of, as believers, that we should be praying for people. And I have been encouraged, and a lot of people say, well, look, it's a bunch of pagans praying and so forth, and I 100% get that. But all 32 teams in the NFL, on their Twitter page, as their picture, switched it to pray for Damar. And the topic of prayer has been something that's very popular with everything that's going on, and I'm sure atheists are not happy with that, which I'm always glad about. But it's one of those things that you see this and you go, does it make you mad that everyone wants to pray when this is going on? Or do you take the approach of, hey, there is no atheist in a foxhole. That's a very common saying. That's a very common statement. There's no atheist in a foxhole. Because when the rubber meets the road, people go crying out to something. And that's something that we actually see in Scripture. In the book of Jonah, and it's a very short book, you can read the entire thing, but in the book of Jonah, in chapter 1, we actually read of what takes place when Jonah is on a boat and he's supposed to be going to Tarshish, or he's supposed to be going to Nineveh. And while he's supposed to be going to Nineveh, he goes the precise opposite way. And so what takes place is now they are getting, they are getting run amok. The, the, it is going crazy and everything is just what is going on. So what happens? On what account? What takes place when these pagans who do not know the true God see all of this going on around them? It tells us, starting in verse 4, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, 
And there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. The sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God. And they threw the cargo, which was in the ship, into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and falling sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, how is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. It's interesting because in verse nine, it says, he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. It says in verse 14, then, then they called on the Lord and said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, Yahweh is actually what they cry out to. Do not let us perish on account of this man's life and do not put innocent blood on us. For you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. They were crying out to their false gods, but ultimately when their false gods didn't hear them, and even Jonah being in his disobedience told him, I've told them I fear the Lord. Granted, he was running away from him. And then God ended up using a big fish in order to swallow him up and spit him out in the place he was supposed to go. But what happened? These guys were crying out to their false gods and their false gods were giving them nothing. So what we should be doing is crying out to the one true God. And when people are on this and this is going on, it's great for us to say, you know what? I don't mind praying for that person. There's a lot of people that are hurting and I try to pray for them all the time. The Bible says for us that we are supposed to pray without ceasing. And yet this is going on. And something that did encourage me, and I'm just going to be honest, there were things I wish were said, but ultimately I don't know what I do in those situations. And there's an NFL player named Dan Orlovsky, a former NFL player named Dan Orlovsky, and he was actually someone who was famous for, in the middle of a game on the Detroit Lions, running out of bounds, not even knowing that he had committed a safety while running away from his opponents, not knowing where his feet were. But nonetheless, that's what he was famous for. But I'm hoping that he becomes famous for this and openly sharing his faith. Because when this all was going down, he actually got on live TV, on ESPN, on the show NFL Live, and said, you know what, I'm going to pray because people believe in prayer. Don't get me wrong, it's not the perfect prayer, and I wish he said this and quoted this verse, and he says, in your name instead of in Jesus' name. But I want to encourage you guys, because this was actually something that I think is praiseworthy. We can say, wow, that's pretty awesome that this happened on live TV with a bunch of viewers that don't know Christ. And I want you to hear it. I've heard it all day, like thoughts and prayers. And you just heard Scherf and Jonathan Allen say, like, all we can do is pray for him. And I've heard the Buffalo Bills organization say that we believe in prayer. And maybe this is not the right thing to do, but I want to, it's just on my heart that I want to pray for. It is. Damar Hamlin right right, right now. Um, I'm going to do it out loud. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to bow my head and I'm just going to pray for him. Um, God, we come to you in these moments that we don't understand, that are hard, uh, because we believe that your God and coming to you and praying to you um, has impact. We're, we're sad, we're angry, um, and we want answers, but some things are unanswerable. We just want to pray, truly come to you and pray for strength for Damar, for healing for Damar, for comfort for Damar to be with his family, to give them peace. If we didn't believe that prayer didn't work, we wouldn't ask this of you, God. Um, I believe in prayer. We believe in prayer. We lift up Damar Hamlin's name in your name. Amen. 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 You know, one of the things that I love that he stated there was the fact that prayer is important. And I know that there's a campaign against thoughts and prayers. I don't know how much thoughts do, but I know what prayers do. And the prayer of the righteous man can availeth much. And the truth is, that's what we should be hoping for, and we should be hoping that for someone. And and one of the things we've encouraged our young adult group and and our our high school group and our middle school group is to pick out somebody right now, somebody you know needs Christ, someone you know this maybe for the entire year that you can sit down and pray for and you want to see come to Christ. Make some pointed prayers, you know, instead of a grenade Uh, you know, actually shoot and aim at a specific person to say, I want to pray for that person to come to know you. And what's awesome is I want you to hear this because this is actually what the player, the NFL player was worried about when he woke up and started writing things down because he has uh, awakened from his coma and he's has a lot of signs moving upward. And a lot of people are even asking the doctors who performed them, performed on him, Hey, is this something that you know, do you feel the prayers of people and, and what, what is going on? And it was awesome to hear 
that they said this, but I just want to bring a slight correction to this, but there was something that was really cool that DeMar actually asked if his team won the game when he woke up. And what was replied to him was very interesting. What was replied to him is that you've won the game of life. And I think that's a great statement. You've won the game of life. But truly, the only way to win the game of life is winning the game of eternal life. The only way to live a life more abundantly here on earth is to know Christ, to know the truth, the truth setting you free and being saved and in Christ. Ultimately, somebody could have a miracle take place and then be saved, or doctors could be used just like Jonah uh, having the whale used by God in order to deliver him as well. So God can use any means he wants, including non-believing doctors and believing doctors. But ultimately, I believe it is our prayers, that God can use your prayers. And what we want is for DeMar Hamlin, if he doesn't know Christ, I know there's some people who say he's a, he's a believer, which would be awesome. If he doesn't know Christ, this would be a great time for him to come to know Christ. And for those that are praying but don't really know Jesus, I pray that what takes place is what took place on the boat with Jonah, that ultimately they go, wait a second, who is this one true God? And they cry out to the one true God because the life we want is the life that comes through Jesus Christ and his blood that was spilled on Calvary's cross for the sins that we committed, the things that we deserved. We deserved a lot more than dying on a football field. We deserve eternal death and to pay for the sins that we've committed against God. And with the purchase, the great ransom that was paid, by Jesus Christ himself on Calvary's cross, we can be looked at when God sees us on Judgment Day, and it's not a doctor asking us and, and us asking if we want a game, but God saying, why should I let you in? And instead of it being because I did all these good things, because I prayed this prayer and I you know, worship nature, it should be because of what Jesus Christ did, and I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and when he sees me on the Day of Judgment, he doesn't see Chad and all the wicked things he's done. But what he sees is Jesus Christ, his son, paid in full the sins that I've committed. Turn to him now, put your trust in him, and love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This has been Chad Davidson. This is the 511 News. Thank you guys so much for watching 511 News. You can check out some of the older episodes as well as the Good Fight Radio Show and videos we have right here on our YouTube channel. And this week's featured product is the Kinsey Syndrome. You can check this out at goodfight.org. God bless you guys.